Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are live at SL20B. I'm your host, Strawberry Linden, and I'm here at the beautiful SL20B Arboretum celebrating Second Life's 20th birthday with our executive chairman, Oberwolf Linden, and the founder of Second Life, Philip Linden. Welcome back to the show, Oberwolf and Philip. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to see so many people. Wow. I'm so excited. I, before I continue, I just want to make sure everybody in the in-world audience can hear all three of us. Can you guys hear us? Say hi. And also on the YouTube channel, can you hear us, everybody? Just checking. Everybody seems to be hearing us. Okay. <laughs> Looks good. Off to a great start. Uh, I, I have to say before we begin that we have these two beautiful Linden Bears um, in front of us. And one of them is Oberwolf's and one of them is Philip's. And you can pick them up uh, just by clicking on them. Uh, so we all we came prepared to give out our Linden Bears. So uh, they're right there for you. And Oberwolf and Philip, I have a lot of questions from the community that have been coming in for the last few weeks. Uh, and I just want to get into it right away. But before I have I start with the questions, of course, I have to ask you about SL20B. Have you had a chance to check it out yet? And if so, what are your favorite exhibits and areas to explore? So, uh, Philip, why don't you go first? I just started looking around yesterday a little bit, and I love it. Um, I love the gift section. That's cool. Um, I was like uh, snooping in the audience yesterday, <laughs> yes. I think, when... Uh, uh, Grumpity and Mojo, I think we're we're talking, and so I was I was lurking, and uh, I love the builds, and I'm going to keep looking around after this. Great, I saw you snooping there. Everybody was really excited to see you there. How about you, Oberwolf? Well, last you? night I went into Motown and spent oh. some time there, and then took the shuttle to the hub because I wanted to see that before going into. SLB and I met up with someone and was transported and took a ride on his motorcycle um, <laughs> through a a, wow. a a motorcycle racetrack that he had built. He was located somewhere. It was translating Spanish in real time, and I got so um, caught up in it that by time uh, it was it was done, it was midnight, and I thought I better get a good night's sleep. So. Um, <laughs> After spending an hour with uh, this gentleman, um, I, uh, so that was my that was one of my best experiences wow. getting taken around on the back of a motorcycle for an hour. That sounds like an, a great Second Life adventure. I'm a little bit jealous, but great fun. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start off with some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, first one is for you, Philip. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of Second Life 20 years ago? What inspired you to create? Second Life, and what was it like in the early days? And also, did your original vision play out the way you expected? A lot of questions there. Well, I guess I could give you like the, I guess I'll try to give you like the one minute answer. I could give you the 10 second answer or the 10 hour answer. Let's go for the that. 10 hour um, one. I'm up for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's do Lex Friedman style. I was just <laughs> saying that to somebody. Um, I, I do think I'm actually, in, in part, in partial answer to that, I think I'm going to start doing some uh, podcasts with some of the um, early oh. members of the team and other people from Second Life and just trying to trying to put it all down. But, you know, for example, Strawberry, mm -hmm. the very beginning of Second Life and the, the as, as some of you may know, um, uh, Andrew or Leviathan Linden was actually the very first employee to join, um, yes. to join Second Life, to join me in November of 1999 in Hayes Valley, San Francisco. And at that time, he and I were actually working on a hardware prototype of a VR device, basically, which is just so crazy. We built a, a kind of a VR headset to end all VR headsets uh, that was called the Rig, and that was actually the very, very beginning. That you know, that's the beginning of the long story. That that was the very start of the work that we did on Second Life, and then about nine months or so in, we started devoting ourselves to the building of the software of a virtual world that you know at the very start was designed not so much to be um necessarily a place for the sort of avatars and things that we're all sitting in right now but instead it was designed to be more of a kind of physics simulation of an enormous world that was spanning across many many server computers so you know as as many know that was kind of the original excitement for me behind second life was to build a playground where 
you could understand the laws of physics, whatever they were, and you could manipulate things. You know, you could build things live. That was sort of the, you know, original dream of it. And then I would say as people started coming in and representing themselves, you know, presenting themselves as avatars and then being like affected by that in the way, in the impact that it had, say, on their relationships with others or their relationship with themselves, I think that was kind of a big change for me where I then was like, wow, this is this is something really remarkable. And I think like everybody else, I was you know caught up in that. So I don't know if that's a helpful starting point, but that's kind of the beginning of it all. I love it. So how does it feel to see your creation go wild and veer into something so different and wonderful? Well, it is amazing to reflect on 20 years of Second right. Life. I mean, I think if you'd asked me at the beginning, what was, what was I like, like in 20? years i mean i just would have said i have no idea and is it going to be or you know will it will it be there in 20 years oh my gosh you know um going wild i mean i think i always i was so i'm so happy that we've had such a diversity of things happen here i guess that's maybe a quick answer you know it makes me very happy if if by wild you mean so many things so many outrageous things so many unimaginable things have happened in here. I, I think that very fact is the thing that makes me deeply, deeply happy and that I couldn't have, I certainly couldn't have imagined in the beginning. Yeah. I, I have more questions about that for later on in the show. I, I want to pick on Oberwolf for a second. Uh, in a previous Lab Gab, you shared a bit about how you first met Philip and discovered Second Life. And over two years have now passed since you acquired Linden Lab as part of an investment group. Can you give us an update on how you think, think things are going with Second Life and what excites you most about the future and also what worries you? Well, thanks. Yeah, so Philip and I have known each other for a long time. But to, an to, to answer the question um, specifically, I think the biggest thing, and I'll be honest, you know, getting what, when I, when we talk about this stuff and, and um, uh, you know, you bought Second Life and, and sort of uh, thinking of myself as an investor, if there's one thing that's changed over the past two and a half years is life is you don't own Second Life. Um, you think you do in the beginning, <laughs> you think, you think you've bought something, you don't own second life, the residents own second life, the Lindens own second life, and I'm along for the ride. And if there's one thing that's on a motorcycle, right, and last night <laughs> right. Was on a motorcycle, you know, and, and, and really it wasn't an investment group that bought second life. It was, um, a friend of mine and I, uh, and so the thing that's happened over the past two and a half years is fortunately, I feel I've been welcomed by the Linden, by the Lindens, um, by the, the team top to bottom, by Tussle, and by the Second Life community as a whole. And so if there's one thing that's changed, it's that I no longer think of it as a company. I think of it almost as a movement or um, a little, a lot more probably what Philip um, uh, designed and, and thought of and all the, all the residents and communities have built. And I almost feel rather than an owner or steward, I feel that it's almost, it's not almost, it's a moral imperative that Second Life continues for the next 20 years and I think that's what I view my role as now. It's shifted from being, from, from looking at it as a business into now looking at it as something that, that simply must continue on. Right. Well, I love that. So is there anything that you're worried about the future? Well, when I, when then I do look at it in terms of metrics, one of the interesting things about Second Life is that um, it is that it's 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 very stable, and that's a good thing in many ways. There are some declines in the number of residents and some of the things, and and if I was afraid of anything, it's that. 
it's that we don't want this to go away. And so how do you put in the resources, right? Second Life's a very expensive entity to keep going. And you have certain resources. Do you put all your resources into making the world the absolute best for the current community and residents? Or do you divert some of those resources into bringing in new people to keep the community vibrant, keep it alive, keep it changing, keep it fresh? And if you think that you have to do that, how do you decide where that break is? It's certainly not 50-50. Uh, so, so, so the worry is not about second life. The worry is, you know, when I go to sleep, it's how, how can I give the most resources to both those things to ensure that second life is so vibrant in the future. And my worry is <laughs> don't, don't fuck it up. Like don't make a mistake here. <laughs> right. And so, and so that's really, that's the worry is about what that. And so I rely extraordinarily heavily on Tuso and the Lindens to make the best decisions there. Okay. Well, that's what I love about you actually, because you have like a deep love for second life. And I, I'm, I just appreciate that so much. And uh, I'm kind of worried about the, <laughs> We're live on air, but hopefully they should be all right. So, <laughs> so Philip, I'm going to ask you the same question. What excites you most about the future of Second Life, and what worries you the most? Well, that was, you know, like Overwolf just said. I, I, let me pull the camera out and talk about the worries. Actually, okay, I think it's kind of fun here. You know, yeah, we Second Life has been. I mean, it's been such amazing, and I know everybody here in Second Life feels the same way over the last couple of years to see everybody sort of come back to Second Life and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this thing Facebook is talking about it, it does exist. Um, uh, you know, it, it hasn't started up so much around VR headsets, but it does exist. And, and I think, you know, we're all coming back now and looking at Second Life and looking at the few other, uh, you know, real multi-person virtual worlds that are out there and wondering about, is the metaverse a good thing, right? You know, are is it a good thing? Should should we as human beings be uh, sitting in virtual worlds as avatars as opposed to, you know, doing doing things in the real world? And I think Second Life is both, well, first of all, Second Life is fundamentally an inspiration for how that can go right, right? right. We're all supporting each other and we've created a, a world here that has been an immensely positive thing for people to come to. But at the same time, we're all worldwide, not just because of metaverse technology development, but also because of the affairs of the world, you know, things like AI and disinformation and everything that's happening and the, the climate in the world. We're looking at how uh, things can go terribly wrong with technology. And I do worry that if we played the bad things that have happened in the last decade, say on social media, out in a virtual world, things could go horribly wrong, especially if there were a lot of people using those worlds. And so I think Second Life, you know, fully answering your question, Second Life, what, what I'm excited about is that Second Life continues to show the way toward a positive, human-centered, uh, you know, people supporting experience, individual, you know, an individual behavior and intention supporting kind of experience it can happen in a metaverse like this but at the same time i'm worried that it won't <laughs> more broadly i'm worried that we sh need to get that word out and you know a lot of my own work lately is talking about these things trying to articulate what in specific examples second life did right and how that might be applied to broader phenomena you know ranging from social media communication to digital currencies you know things like that interesting i like that answer so i'm going to go back to oberwolf i have i have more of a kind of a deeper conversation uh another question regarding this later in the show too but oberwolf i wanted to um, ask you the second life identity was fully formed when you took over has it been difficult to make your own imprint on a community so fully seasoned? Uh, I, I never intended or tried to have my own imprint on it. It was never, 
it's it's never been on my top 100 list of things to do. So mm -hmm. the honest answer is I have no idea because I, I never tried. What what my I always saw my goal as releasing the Lindens to do what they love to make Second Life the best for the community. Mm -hmm. And my role is to provide things that are usually constrained, which is um, resources, to provide resources so that, so that the Lindens, who are the stewards and, and the community, can create the best Second Life there is. And while that, I'm not trying to come across as holy when I say that. There is a business reason for that. I do believe that that's what's going to make Second Life the most valuable as well. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not a charity. But like I've said many times, Second Life is not inexpensive to run. There are a lot of people that do a lot of great work and AWS is, is expensive. And so, and so creating that opportunity, that's the impact. That's the imprint that I wanted to give. Freedom for people to make these decisions. When we, when, when we took over, mm -hmm. the major thing that happened was the decision-making and the investor base changed from venture capitalists to two individuals. And that's a big difference. Um, and some businesses got uh, moved out under the Linden um, entity. That was all done to free up resources. That's the imprint that I want. And I do think that that has been welcomed. I hope it has. Yeah. And, but never have I thought to, to, that it is my role or desire to make a personal imprint on Second Life. That's never been, that's never been on the list of to-dos. So I guess you would have to ask the Lindens if, um, if this new way of looking at it, if it has a new way of looking at it and how it's going. <laughs> I think I think they appreciate uh, how you're handling it too. So this question, the next question, was actually asked quite a bit uh, by different members of the community. And since we're on the topic of decisions, after the beloved Ebe Altberg, Linden Lab never announced a new CEO. Is there a new CEO now? And is it Philip? Uh, you want to tell us Oberbuff first? Then I'll yeah, I mean, I I can answer. Um that it's not Philip. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, he, I, I don't think he wants the role. Um, so, so I think the way to answer the question, first of all, what does a CEO do? And, right. and why is there, is there a, a CEO of Linden? So if we think about what, what a CEO does, a CEO um, is the, the, by the definition, is the chief executive. So all executives report into the CEO. And the CEO um, manages the board from the bottom up. Uh, the chairman manages the board from the top down. And the CEO is in charge of allocating resources, is in charge of hiring, firing, motivating employees, setting culture, making, um, being the ultimate buck stops here, um, and, and various other CEO type things. When we look at Linden, each of those things is being served. They right. just are not served by the same person or by a title called CEO. So what, what Second Life has, so first of all, I'm, I'm executive chairman, which means I'm not a sit back chairman. I am an active participant in the management of Linden. Um, and that's an important distinction between the management of Second Life. So the way I look at it is as executive chairman, I manage the board. The board is three people. I'm one of them. That's a pretty easy management. The other is one of my closest friends ever. And then you have to have someone who's not, you know, who's what we would call independent. So that's a pretty good and fun job. Um, Second Life has a group called TUSL, the Office of Second Life. Right. They serve 
as that role of the executive that everybody reports to, and they report to each other. Now, Tussle reports to me as executive chair. So in that sense, you could say that I am the chief executive, mm -hmm. but it's really not true when it comes to Second Life. And because I wanted to maintain that difference, I could have taken the CEO role of Lyndon. I did not want to take the CEO role of Second Life. I wanted to maintain that. So one way is I could have been really, really complicated and tried to explain this super complicated thing that I wanted to get across. The other way was to not have a CEO. So I do a lot of the roles that a CEO would do, specifically mm -hmm. about Lyndon, but Pusel is really the CEO of Second Life. And I love that. Now, I will tell you that every business friend investor that I have thinks that I'm crazy. But <laughs> if, you, if you think you can manage Second Life without being crazy, then you're actually crazy. So, um, so, so that's, the, that's the real answer. So there is no CEO, but every role of the CEO is being filled. It's a group effort. And it's a good group, I have to say. So then, Philip, can you clarify a bit more about the role that you have at Linden Lab now? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as Brad just said, we, the very, I, I read a wonderful, you, you've probably all seen it, there's an Atlantic article yes. uh, whose title, yesterday, whose title is, I think, what is it, there will never be another, another second, second life. life. Yeah. And I think that that is, of course, literally true. Um, of Second Life, but I also think, as 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 Brad was explaining, the uh, the way that the world got built also affected and was affected by the way the company was built. And yeah, the company is also unusual in that it has a uh, uh, the depth, complexity, and age of Second Life means that the natural way to manage it is different. Uh, as as Oberwolf was explaining, it's it's different than a traditional sort of very reactive, top down, uh, you know, product leadership kind of a strategy that you see so often in tech companies. This is just a different situation because we've got um, so much happening here. There are so many different communities and voices and intentions that are here that it doesn't give it doesn't easily. It's not something that you can manage in a standard Silicon Valley sort of way. So I think, yeah, the the uh, the absence of a CEO does not have the same meaning here that it would in a in a more typical company. And and my sorry, and my role is to um, as an advisor to be helpful when I can. So my interactions will be things like occasional conversations that somebody might reach out to me about a specific you know thing that we're doing that I can opine on for example but um, my uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty busy across the board these days and my um, involvement with second life is is a little a little bit of my time and a lot of my love and I and I'm actually uh, uh, with the work that I'm doing lately I'm actually often in the actual Linden Lab office, so it's delightful to see Lindens in here when, when we're in here. But as you know, we're a mostly remote company, so yeah. um, happily, so we're often not. <laughs> yes, I heard you're in the office a lot. That's great. Oh, that's, yeah. that's great. I know there's a lot of love there, too, so it's it's wonderful to hear. Um, Oberwolf, I'm going to go back uh, to you with another question, this time about Tilia. Many in the Second Life community continue to be curious about Tilia. Can you give us an update on Tilia and how will Tilia's growth potentially benefit Second Life? Sure. And I, I always find this question so interesting because I think it comes from a two places. One, a good place of, of being curious. And two, a place of being worried. And I, and I want to respect the second one um, because it's probably larger uh, than the first. Um, second life, Linden has a, has, has a reputation or there's a myth um, that it takes resources away to do other projects. And in the past, I can't opine on the past. Um, so in the past, that may or may not have happened. Second life cannot exist without Tilia. Tilia isn't a project. 
Affiliate isn't a cool thing that we're trying to do at Linden. Second Life is extraordinarily complicated, and particularly around uh, the financial aspects. As, as everyone here knows, Second Life is like no other. There is no other call it virtual world, joke about it and call it a metaverse. There's no other thing out there that operates in the same way. Unfortunately or fortunately, this requires a set of, of uh, this requires us to abide by a set of regulations that are incredibly complicated and very expensive. There's no way around it, though. There's, there, this isn't a choice of working with Tilia. So the one thing, if I could get anything across, it's that to not think of Tilia as competition or it, it, if Tilia went away, we would have to use another Tilia. Um, yeah. We just wouldn't own it. So that would be much worse because then we would be reliant on, on something that we don't own. Now, if you think of it that way, what we realized was because this Tilia thing is so special and Second Life is so unique, but also very expensive to run, what if we allowed Tilia to service other non-competitive or even, you know, or other companies that, um, that could benefit from Tilia? Now, why is that so valuable? Well, one, that could make Tilia more valuable. And since Linden owns Tilia, that gives Linden more resources to put towards Second Life. So that's a good one. Two, the more, the more money Tilia makes, the less money Second Life has to spend to support it. And so it seemed like a really good idea to open Tilia up to other sources of making money so that this very expensive and completely necessary. There's no getting out of it. So this very expensive entity um, could operate less expensively to Second Life. So the question about, you know, is if Tilia is very successful, that is very, very good for Second Life. Very good for Second Life. So everybody here wants Tilia to be successful. For sure. The, the, yeah, and, and you, we're just not getting away from it. We we need Tilia, and Tilia, you know, obviously also relies on Second Life. Second Life's Tilia's largest customer, um, but it's not something that we're just investing in just to kind of take a flyer on. It is it is an absolute regulatory necessity given the way Second Life has been built. Right. Very true. Okay, great. And good to hear good to hear all this stuff for sure. I know it, it kind of eases people's minds. So the next question I have for both of you, uh, 2022 was a bit of a crazy year with a lot of built up hype for the metaverse and related concepts and technologies like Web3 and NFTs. And now in 2023, much of that hype has now subsided. And now the latest media darling is artificial intelligence. How do you think SL fared compared to Meta, Facebook, and many of the other Web3 platforms? And can we expect any form of AI integration into Second Life in the future? So, uh, Phil, why don't you go first? Well, first off, I think Second Life's fared great. I, I think we're into a nice Second Life hype cycle right now. I think it's delightful. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's made for me sure. smile. Uh, I think there are bad ways and good ways to mix AR with a. I'm sorry, AI with virtual worlds. Um, I've been doing some sort of laboratory explorations with some other friends lately on uh, many, many different things related to AI, and as it relates to you know, say powering avatars with AI uh, engines. I think there are good things we can do, and I think there are harmful things we can do. And it's a, a bit like this broader conversation about the utility of virtual worlds. So um, I think what is actually what I've already seen happening, I believe, I, I think there's a bunny GPT, right? That's right. out there on the grid right now. Yeah. Uh, I think there will be many, many experiments uh, probably the majority of them, not even by, say, Linden Lab, but there will be many experiments in how to, what to do with AI. I think as a broad moral compass on that, um, 
my my take is a simple one, which is we must use technology, not just AI, but all technology. We must use technology to bring ourselves toward each other, not away from each other. So if we use virtual worlds or AI in virtual worlds as a way of not of talking less to real human beings, we are making a terrible mistake as a society and you know as a species. If, on the other hand, we use AI to bring us toward each other, um, then we're then we're doing a very very good thing. And I think creating trust and creating connections and creating connections with people you don't know remains uh, one of the most important things that we face together. You know, as human beings right now. So I would like to see us use AI, for example, to say make us into better communicators or help us resolve disputes with each other or things like that. Um, I do not want to see us use AI in ways that cause us to, as a result, communicate less with each other, say by, you know, using AIs to be a, you know, friendlier, dumber version of each other. Um, we certainly don't want to do that. Well, that's a wonderful way to put it. How about you, Oberwolf, do you want to add anything to that? Following Philip on a conversation about AI and, and Second Life is like going into a boxing ring with Mike Tyson after he knocks <laughs> after he knocked someone else out. So um, here's here's what I'll say in the way I think about it. Mm -hmm. If if you're not open to change, if you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevance a lot less. Yeah, that doesn't mean you jump into change and change because of change. What it means is be open to everything and make your decisions to stay relevant to each other. So that's sort of the direction I give. It's not about should we let AI in or not. Mm -hmm. It's be open to everything without being afraid of change, but keeping a very specific moral compass, which I go to Philip for all the time, very specific on what you're trying to accomplish. If you get very specific on what you're trying to accomplish, and you're very open to how to get there, then AI just becomes a tool. Do we want to use it? Do we want to not use it? I don't know. Figure that out. The key is keeping that goal, keeping that vision, keeping that future in mind and being open to change because we do not want to end up saying no to things that then make us irrelevant. That would be an awful ending. Oh, so true. that's kind of the way, that's the, that's, that's the openness and the direction um, and Tussle, that Tussle has. That's great. And speaking of change, on to my next question. Many in the community have been begging for an official mobile viewer for quite some time. And there is genuine excitement over the news that a proper mobile app is in the works. And we just saw a brand new developer update yesterday from the executive team. So people are very excited. What impact do you think mobile will have on the Second Life community and platform? And do you think that the mobile viewer should differ from the desktop Second Life experience? Oberwolf, why don't you go first this time? Hey, the, someone's working on a mobile app? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> um, yeah. So here's the, here's the, this is the, the pentultimate or the ultimate example of, of freeing up, um, of freeing up resources, right? Yeah. Mobile app, a lot of resources devoted to it. So the excitement around the mobile app um, is well deserved for, for two reasons. One, I think it's going to be really good for the current, um, for the Second Life community. And the excitement is also well-deserved because it's gonna be awesome. And you know, you've know, you worked with me for a, for a long time, Strawberry. I, I tend not to throw, it, well, <laughs> you're lucky I didn't throw out the word before awesome. Um, so I learned my lesson on that one. I forgot that we're in a G-rated area. Um, the, uh, the, the, the mobile app is gonna be great. You asked a, a, a specific question about what should we do? Should we build um, the desktop version that works on a on a mobile app, or or start with the concept of it's mobile? What do we do with Second Life? And we, I think, we made some decisions that 
are that hopefully are good. Um, I think ultimately it doesn't matter. It 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 you're going to end up in in one of two places. But we the team decided to really take the beauty and the the really the gorgeousness of Second Life and have that be a priority for the mobile app. And and the reason why I liked that was because that is one of the things that sets us apart. We do have the most beautiful experience. We have the most beautiful avatars. We have the most customized um, experience. That's really hard to do in mobile. Mm -hmm. So the team took on a really big challenge. And so I want everyone to realize that, that we could have gone a different direction and just done very mobile app things with Second Life. So we could have built you know, Second Life TikTok or Second Life um, uh, Tinder. We could have just made a, 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 a chat app. We could have made it so that you can manage your land. We could have done it in that way also, which also would have been very valuable, right? We could have made mobile apps if you're, you know, to, to manage your, your assets and your home and, and, and things like that. We chose to do it in this way. That's what's so exciting about it. Just I now everyone has to keep in mind that we took the harder road. And so the the key to keep in mind is this is not something that's going to get launched and be done. This is a 10 year journey. Right. Um, and, and I think that's really important because as exciting as it is, is and as exciting as excited as everyone is, expectations have to be in line with this is really hard to do, to take Second Life and put it on a phone or an iPad. Like that's not an easy thing. And it's taking an incredible amount of resources. And so I love the excitement. I'm a little afraid uh, for the team. Um, I play it, with it a lot. I actually am on the mobile app testing and running around more than on the desktop just to just to keep looking at all the changes and things that get going. I, th I think I'm probably giving a, a longer answer than you wanted, but it, that was great. The, the goal now, again, so let's talk about what the goal was. The mm -hmm. goal is, do you build it for current residents? Do you build it for the community. You build it to bring in new residents. And we clearly made a decision to build it for current residents that, that they are our, our number one. However, we are also going to work very hard on using it to bring back a lot of folks who were part of the Second Life community for a while and then have left for a variety of reasons. But if they've left because they're watching TikTok videos at the <laughs> end of the day, like bring them back. And so what I hope is, that's, and that's another reason why we built it a lot for the current residents, because that should be the best app to bring people who were part of Second Life for five years, but left three years ago, right. building the app for them, that's beautiful. We'll figure out how to bring new people into the Second Life community. That's a different experience. And so this was a very, there was a lot of conversation going into this. And all we can say is we hope we made as the best decision we could. I think you did. I'm looking forward to all the changes. How about you, Philip? What do you think? Uh, how do you think mobile will impact the community? Well, I would add to that a historical point, you know, as, as the founder that we started, I started the company in 99. And, you know, as I was just saying at the beginning, the really earnest work on Second Life, the platform we're using today started in about late 2000. What that means is that we couldn't possibly have designed for mobile because the mobile experience as we know it today was really launched by the iPhone in 2007. So um, we sort of missed it or we were blindsided by mobile in as substantial a way as one possibly could. You know, we had built yeah. this incredibly graphically intensive high bit rate um, desktop application and then mobile became a thing right in the middle of that, right when we were climbing the growth curve at its steepest point, right? so. I don't know how we could have accommodated that. And I remember just being, you know, completely befuddled by the success of mobile and then the growing question of how we would, what we would do with it. 
That said, um, skipping forward to now, I think that it is a complicated thing to make an experience which is so immersive and rich work on a small field of view mobile device that you use with your you know thumbs rather than with a mouse and keyboard. So as Oberwolf said, to really bring mobile to second life is not a simple port. It's an ongoing journey where we have to re-examine what the nature of the kind of intimate communication that you can have here looks like if you're using a mobile you know, device. Right. In addition to that, I think we have to respect, uh, as Oberwolf alluded to as well, that there is a real difference now given the success we've had and therefore the longevity Second Life has between those who joined it in the very beginning. And for example, many of the people using Second Life in the audience today remember the world before the mobile device, you know, before the smartphone. And in fact, some of them, I saw some text scroll by there, you know, have decided not to have mobile devices anyways, right? So there's in fact a generational difference, right? Um, right. A, 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 however, on the flip side, right, if you talk about a game like Fortnite, right? Like the majority, like I have seen younger people play Fortnite and shoot each other on a on a on a iPhone in ways that I didn't even think were, were physically possible, you know, mm -hmm. for a human being to do with their hands. And so we also have to accommodate that there's this immense generational challenge where we're designing for people who uh were with us before there were even smartphones and have no interest in them. And then people who think about the way they use apps on a smartphone in an utterly different and new way because of their youth. And so that is a big deal too, you know, like just, yeah. you know, for example, the different um, feelings we all have about text versus voice communication, you know, that's a great example of a just profoundly generational issue, you know, where, where the world is, is changing incredibly rapidly and substantially because of technology changes. Right. So speaking of, um, now that we have a plan for mobile, do we have one for VR? What, where does VR fit into Second Life's future? And is this something that, you know, we are thinking about or working on? Yeah, let, let me start on that one. Um, you know, I spent the last 10 years working with High Fidelity, as many people here know, yeah. Uh, to build a kind of a new second life that was designed to be, um, you know, fundamentally accessed from through, through VR devices. And so I have learned a lot and bled a lot uh, in this area. Um, I think getting to uh, making a virtual world like Second Life something that can operate from the vantage point of a VR headset I guess the most nuanced thing, we've all got our easy answers to this, like, you know, hey, I can't wear a VR headset for more than 30 minutes, or I can't type while I'm using it. Those things are all fair and true. I would add something more nuanced, which is Second Life is an extraordinarily diverse and welcoming and inclusive community. And that, I would say, is definitely one of its strong suits that has absolutely nothing to do with a particular feature or the technology. Um, VR devices at this point in history are not only uncomfortable and difficult to use but they also for reasons that i'm often you know quoted on because i talk a lot about this they, they also unfortunately tend to be very non-inclusive um and very you know they 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 not everybody can use them you know this the simplistic uh you know, I think Dana Boyd, the amazing Microsoft researcher, was the first one who basically said, uh, hey, everybody, I think people that are um, pe people that are more female than male are going to vomit when they wear these headsets. And you know, yep. she was exactly right yep. uh, from a statistical perspective. And that is a sobering fact. And so, for example, we cannot possibly get to a second life in VR headsets until uh, people can wear them without throwing up. And so, uh, there's, there's a long way to go on that road. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful in the long term, but not in the short term on what can be done with VR tech. Yeah. I have to agree. Cause I speak from experience <laughs> with the VR headset. How about you, um, Oberwolf? Do you have anything to add to that? I can say I'm, I'm, I'm foolishly betting on that 
Um, by time the VR headsets and hardware get good enough that we want to have a VR version of Second Life, by the time that happens, coding will be easy enough because of AI that we'll be able to then create that world really quickly. So um, right now we're not spending any um, resources or real effort on VR, um, but it would be cool if it worked perfectly. So again, back to the change or irrelevance, um, we're, we're certainly going to pay attention to it, um, but it's a, it's a long it's it's not on our roadmap anywhere. Um, so, okay, that's a good yeah. answer. Um, so so Oberwolf Linden Labs' core business model is not ad based, which is actually very rare these days. Is that the direction we will continue with, or can we expect that to change in the future? It is rare, and yeah. it's rare for a reason. And I and I guess I do keep coming back to this. Um, it's expensive to run uh, Second Life. And so it's, it's very appealing and tempting to bring in advertisers. The challenge with that is that currently, um, Tussle and, and I believe very strongly that regardless of how much money that could bring in, it would challenge and potentially ruin the beauty of of what has been created over the past 20 years. Certainly anything that um, was considered behavioral modification advertising. Now, there's a lot of advertising that goes on in Second Life, right? So yeah. there's residents that advertise for, for their stores. So it's an interesting question because it always makes me think like there's tons of advertising in Second Life. And so what obviously what people mean is, are we going to let external companies advertise in our world. Mm -hmm. And right now that is off the table. Um, I'm not trying to play games by saying right now, because I really mean, but later I know it's going to change. There's, it's, it's another one of these. It is, it has in a core value of this company, um, since the beginning, well, actually there was advertising for a while, but it's been a core value of the company that we're not going to let in external advertisers in the way that people are afraid of. And I'm pretty committed to that. The flip side is that there's a reason why all these other companies do it, right? It's, it's extremely profitable. And if we ever got into a situation that I just cannot even foresee at all, where running Second Life was so expensive that it made it so that Second Life wasn't going to exist unless we raised prices so high and things like that, we would probably try to figure something out. Um, but by then, I don't think advertising, that type of advertising is going to be really successful anyway. What I'm trying to avoid is that any of the behavioral modification stuff, um, right. anything that somebody wants to do, right? Like... Motown came in and has built this wonderful world. They didn't do it because they didn't want people exposed to Motown. It's not an advertisement. We required that they built something that was beautiful and people wanted to go to. And there's nothing in the system. We don't make any money. They don't make any money by driving people there. It actually cost us money. Um, so there, that, is, that is an important thing. We brought... Motown in as a brand because they're really cool yeah. and because it's just awesome and because they helped us build this world. But we didn't make money on that. It was quite the opposite. So you want to call that advertising? I don't think so because we spent money on it I, and we didn't advertise for them. So that's the stuff that we will probably continue to lean into. Um, and I don't want people to think that that's advertising. It's uh, like partnerships. Because it, because yeah. it wasn't. Right. How about you, Philip? Yeah, yeah let, let me extend that a little bit. I, that, that was great. I, I think, um, as Oberwolf said, well, first of all, let me back up and say one of the unique requirements of Second Life that's been so wonderful is that we not uh, know much about the people who are using it. Um, and that's fantastic. You know, a huge part of Second Life has been the promise of a Second Life. And so as a result of that, you know, we're like the complete opposite of something like Facebook, right? Where our our part right. part of our value is in not 
identifying you as, as a human, you know? And so what that means, as Brad said, all the behavioral modification and surveillance stuff, we just can't do from the get-go because we just don't even want to know um, anything about the people behind the avatar. So we've had the very good fortune of not being in a situation where we could even explore advertisement. A again, as a historical note, we, we started this company. Well, there are many companies like, say, for example, Microsoft, right, that have historically had tremendous, enormous trillion dollar businesses, um, not by doing advertising, you know, look at Apple selling phones, right? Yeah. Uh, or taxing the, or even taxing the app store, right? That's different than advertisement. So the bad kind of advertisement is behavioral modification and surveillance, surveillance advertising, and the darkness that comes from selling information about people to an advertiser or influencer or politician who then uses it, who, who then weaponizes it, right? So that's one of the things we have to actually stop doing in the real world. We have to make, in my opinion, we have to make surveillance advertising illegal um i think europe's right at the precipice of doing that hooray europe yeah um i think that, that there is a good word you know how sometimes you say if you pick if you pick a positive statement you can steer toward that rather than you know obsessing over the negative statements the positive example of an ad and this is this is what overwolf was saying this is what second life is full of i heard somebody give it this name the other day i'm trying to remember who it is to credit it but it's a contextual ad a contextual ad is what we have in second life it's an ad that doesn't know anything about you, the observer. And so that means the ad can only be chosen by and informed by the context, that is the room you're in, right? Oh. And so uh, a bus ad advertisement, right? Uh, the advertisements in Times Square, those are contextual ads. I think there's a great time and place for those things. And, you know, like Oberwolf was saying, may, maybe someday we invent a way for, as a company to make some money on that. but. That doesn't matter. The, the 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 thing that matters is that we have only contextual ads. Again, in my opinion, both in virtual worlds and on the web, but you know, certainly in virtual worlds. The 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 danger of surveillance and targeting in virtual worlds, especially VR enabled virtual worlds, as I've talked a lot about, is that the asymmetric relationship between the advertiser and the victim, you know, the person who's experiencing the ad is completely unaccept unacceptable. You know, like if you're wearing a VR headset, I've said this before, but for folks that don't, you know, follow this stuff closely, if you're wearing a VR headset, I, within a few seconds of watching your body move because you're wearing that device and so I can see where your head and your hands are, I know exactly who you are. So you can't say no cookies. I, I know wow. when the same physical person comes back to the same space because you're the way you move your head and hands when you talk is basically like your DNA or your retina scan. It positively identifies you within a few seconds. So one, super dangerous. I know who you are if you're wearing a VR headset. And then two, by watching the way you move the VR headset, I can know who you're paying attention to. I can know that you're depressed. I can know weird things. I, I can just know very weird, uncomfortable things about you. You don't know that I know it from the data. And so it is this very very unfair, asymmetric, dangerous relationship. So yeah, advertising is not bad in and of itself. We built the built the business without ads. Um, hooray us! But um, targeted advertising and behavioral modification is incredibly dangerous and something that you know we'll certainly stay away from. Very scary. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we're we're not getting into that mess <laughs> for sure. Um, Philip, I want to continue with you as an entrepreneur. What is your biggest sense of pride in the creation of Second Life, probably just the, probably the topic we were just talking about. And then if you were starting over today with a completely new virtual world, what would you do differently? Oh, wow. Yeah. I'd make us all walk everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no teleporting? That's my half joke. That's my half joke. <laughs> if you know the history of Second Life, you know that we actually did not have teleporting at the very beginning we we did fly everywhere um that of course worked when the world was wow. 20 or 30 sims but uh wouldn't would be harder now to say the least yeah. um and then we had telehubs if though for those who are here who remember telehubs uh the telehubs were kind of regional bus stops that were the only places you could teleport to and then you had to walk from there or fly from there and that was I actually think that was kind of cool. I, I, I would, I would, I would be all for building a little strange Phillips Island region in Second Life where we can explore some of these weird ideas. But um, 
<laughs> but I think that, and, and, and I say that because I think that physicality and believability and predictability, you know, knowing kind of how the world works when you walk around in it, as I said at the beginning, that was the thing that I sort of, you know, from the time I was a kid wanted to see work. And then I got inspired in Second Life by the impact that it had on people and, you know, how people were changed by it. I'd say the two things I'm proudest of, kind of going backwards here, about the world mm -hmm. is one, the incredible diversity of artistic and other forms of uh, uh, exploration and, you know, projection and uh uh creative expression that we see yeah, in second life for sure and then i think the second thing i'm proud of is that we have and I, I think i'm proudest of this we have been able to create a welcoming positive optimistic friendly uh experience you know we we have an intern here this summer who has been wandering around in second life and is is a young person and he just immediately said my God, it's so friendly. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So nice to me. And I really made me smile, you know, like just, just, you know, not having heard it from that angle in a while and hearing it from somebody younger like that, who had, you know, who, who has used all the games and all the different, you know, platforms, of course, because he's a, he's a young person. And uh, that really just made me smile. So I think, I think that's the thing I'm proudest of is that we did in fact manage to create a technology generated world, which does not cause people to hate each other it in fact causes people to you know fall in love and work together and you know make new friends and as uh, oberwolf was saying do talk to people that are speaking completely different languages in fact you know and get right. to like them and so i i think i am proudest uh of that of how we've we've created such a uh, a warm place so, so much of the time i mean obviously every world has come conflict and trouble and yeah. this one is no different but you know I, mean, I think we all know it when we we you know, everybody knows what i'm talking about you know this is a this is a friendly place for sure i actually have a great kind of philosophical question for you later on regarding this topic but um before i get into that are there any specific specific features and improvements you would like to see added to second life in the future um overwolf is there something aside from mobile obviously <laughs> Oh, I I have a super long list. It's just there. None, nobody wants to do them. Um, <laughs> well, give oh, me your I, top I, five. <laughs> that, really, they all they all come from Two Soul. I, okay. I, I again, like I was so into like, oh, I can move my hand and my avatar moves off the camera and right. um, different things. And I I just hear you know hear so many incredible ideas. And and for the for for those listening, so. Um, the the whole team uh, we all went out to Atlanta and and um, we everybody presented a whole bunch of people presented like if they if they could do anything what would they do and they pitched business plans and things and I don't know how many there were maybe there were maybe there were fourteen of them or or something mm -hmm. um, and I would have done all of them so. Um, it's less about what I want to see and more about how, from my side, it's less about more I want to see and more about finding the resources to build it all. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I was there and I want to do all of them too. There were, there were some great pitches for sure. How about you, Philip? Are there any special features, improvements you'd like to see added? Well, I mean, I would like to see Second Life be an experience that is appealing to th th that is something that more people would like to do uh, obviously because you know backing up to what i just said i, I think that it can be a very positive you know life-affirming human-centered experience um i think getting to more people there's obviously everybody's got their their thoughts about that but i think being able to um communicate more effectively as an avatar um overwolf mentioned like moving your hand you know, if I was able to use body language right now and talking to everybody, it would be much, I, I would be much more able to communicate effectively yeah. um, with everyone. And I think that when you, when you get close to an avatar and it doesn't move in a lifelike fashion, there's a thing you have to overcome there to get comfortable with it. And of course, there's lots of reasons to overcome it and get comfortable with it as we all, and, and we are all here now. But I think that I would like to see Second Life I would like to walk up to an avatar in Second Life and feel more like I was uh, able to communicate 
in a natural, normal way, particularly with respect to body language and nonverbal communication. So, and, and I think we're getting to the point tech tech wise where we can do that. Um, but like Overwolf said about mobile, it, it, these things are still hard problems. I've, I've always delighted in working on problems that are pretty early and pretty hard. And that of course is certainly one of them. You know, every, everybody's been beating their head against you know, even with VR headsets, you're still not able to do what I just said. You're not yeah. able to adequately convey nonverbal stimulus. So that's just a tough problem. But that's that's my number one, because I, I personally feel I could be wrong, by the way. I mean, this stuff is hard. And, you know, a world like this is complicated. There's lots and lots of reasons, lots and lots of ways to make it better. But I I do feel like being able to communicate more naturally is uh, that that's what's going to get us. That, yeah. That's what's going to get a lot more people able to have this wonderful experience. Maybe in 10 years, technology will get there and we'll be able to do it more. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so my next question is kind of long, but I really liked this question. It's from one of our um, community members and it's a little bit philosophical. So I'm going to take a deep breath and here we go. So when you look at Second Life... You see a community that is constantly seeking to do good with charitable fundraisers, awareness campaigns, and helping each other in moments of personal crisis. So considering Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that an avatar's physiological and safety needs are met when they first res, and how this baseline of security frees them to focus on the needs for love and esteem and self-actualization... This is not like in real life or in, in most games, which requires some sort of struggle to survive and thrive. What do you think Second Life says about human nature? That's a big one. Philip, you want to go first? Yeah. I, first of all, whoever said that, if they're out there, well said. Yes. Um, I think it's wonderful. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that philosophical question specifically with this idea of eliminating maslow's you know low two needs basically or which whichever way you want to flip the the pyramid but right. uh i do think it's a lovely point that you know restating it that we because we do not need to uh worry about our physical safety or the the need to eat you know um like we do when we're playing the sims haha <laughs> but you know because we don't worry about those things when we come into second life we are freed to exhibit greater action in other layers of that hierarchy. So going back to that, I think what that says about human nature, what Second Life says about human nature, is it, it, it reinforces how social and collaborative and uh, how supportive of each other it is in our nature to be. That is to say, Right. Uh, as soon as we are freed from those base needs, we immediately want to connect with others. Everybody knows, and there's many people in the room, you know, listening to this, that the most introverted, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the person who is farthest over on the side of wanting to be alone and wanting to read a book, you know, will tell you that the magic of Second Life was that they made a friend. Right. And I think that that is what Second Life shows us. It shows us that if we remove these basic problems, you know, from, uh, from ourselves, what we all do is seek to connect with each other. We seek to delight in finding and creating different types of human connection. And that is what we're all about. And Second Life, yep, by kind of turning off those basic needs, it does show us that. And it's very beautiful. And I think that, you know, in these times of you know, in these dark times, right, where we worry that the world is falling apart, we would be wise to look at things like Second Life and remember, it is not in our nature to hurt each other or to ignore each other or to turn away from each other. It's, it's you know, what's in our nature is the opposite of that, to, to be good and to take care of each other. Yeah. And that's what you see in Second Life. It's like how you go in and people want to help you as a new resident you know the for the first thing is you know people are like hey i can help you out here everybody's friendly <laughs> and we've all we've all had that we've all been on probably both sides many people here have been on both sides of that equation right and that's that there it is right we want to help each other that's that's the way people are almost all of the time so i, I love that and i think that was a wonderful question 
Yeah, I have to agree because, I mean, I'm a 16-year resident now and what keeps me logging in are the connections that I've made with people on day one. I still speak to people that I met on day one in Second Life. So it's it's just, it's wonderful. Uh, Overwolf, do you want wow. to add anything to that? Oh come on, strawberry! I'm not following that one. Give give me the next question. Give me give me the next uh, question. <laughs> okay, that was a long one. I have to admit, but it was it was a it was a wonderful question. So I, I definitely wanted to put it in there. The wonderful answer is yes. also what happened. Philip's answer just blows everybody out of the water for sure. Um, so, okay. So the next question is actually pretty great. So I, I want to know, Overwolf, do you log into Second Life often? And if so, what are some of your favorite things to do here? So I log into Second Life more than people think, but for the, a very different reason. So okay. my, most of my logging in is to look at the wonderful new things that the team has created, right? So, right. Um, so if we launch Motown, of course, I'm going to log into Motown. When we've built this new hub, of course, I'm going to log into that. If someone says we've got a new feature, I try I try to do that. And then, like I said last night, what, what my favorite thing to do is just do something quirky um, and, <laughs> and let someone lead me off in, into some area. Last night was actually the best when um, I jumped on the back of, of uh, <laughs> someone's motorcycle and I actually had my son with me. And Aww. I just remember at one time we just looked at each other and he's, you know, he said... Um, He's talked about Second Life and frame rates, and you know he's 19 years old, so <laughs> it, it uh, it's a different experience for him. And he just looked, and we just started laughing. <laughs> we just were having so much fun um, having this resident just take us around on his motorcycle. So so that's that's what I do when I log in. That's great. And how about you, Philip? Do you log in often? And if so, what do you do? I have a totally different experience, you know, like okay. I just have to be, first of all, there's just the guilty pleasure of being Philip Linden. So like, <laughs> yeah, I logged in with, I logged in with an alt the other day and I was talking to somebody in the Toma, I think like near the, you know, the old kind of beginning of the world. And I, uh, it was so funny because I said, no, 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 it's really Philip. I said, oh, I don't know. Ask me some hard question. And so I was trying to convince them that it was really me, but I just said, oh, I don't, I, I didn't have my passwords. I, I, I didn't have the password to Philip Linden with me, but I always go in as Philip Linden because, I mean, who wouldn't want to be Philip Linden right, hanging around in Second Life? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so one is I just enjoy the experience of being me in there, which is which is just a total guilty pleasure. Um, another thing is I go to places that are really busy. Like I've gone to the London New User area a lot. I, I, I dig that, you know, London City. Um, I will show people Second Life a lot. So a lot of times, like when you run into me, I'm distracted because I'm like, Somebody's yep. sitting next to me and I'm showing them the world. Another frequent reason for me to log in will be to like see art, you know, but there again, I'm often just trying to kind of full on blow people's minds with how much stuff there is. So I kind of oscillate. A, I love just being me and enjoying that. B, I, I go to places where there's a ton of people because I just feel like that's vibrant, you know, or C and or C, I go to somewhere that's like a specific piece of art that I've heard about that I want to, I want to, uh, I want to check out. Yeah, I saw you tweet about an art exhibit, which was really great. Uh, great to see you exploring there too. Right. Okay, so where do you see Second Life 10 years from now? Philip, you want to take that one first? Well, I mean, maybe right where it is. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> I feel like in the past I was always trying to, you know, brandish the sword of we must do this one thing next, you know, and I don't know. The, the, the older and wiser I've gotten, I'm not really sure that that's... Uh, as much when I, what, how I want to answer that question. I mean, I think that what is what is so marvelous about Second Life and the fact that we're celebrating 20 years of it right now is that it is like a real world, a kind of a slowly changing, stable sort of a thing, you know? So I don't know. I, I it, Is it possible that it could be like remarkably similar in some ways to what it is 10 years from now? Yeah, maybe. And maybe that'll be just a wonderful thing. Like Overwolf said, and, and I, as I said, to remain... Um, what did, what did you say, Overwolf? That was great. You were like, nothing is worse than irrelevance. Yes. Well, you can, that, you, you, if, you, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance a lot less. I, yep. Yeah, you'll, you'll like, I love that. I should have used that wording. There's a famous story from the beginning of Second Life where everybody was yelling and screaming about something. <laughs> and I literally got up as my avatar. This is before voice. So I got up as my avatar literally on like a cube so that I could be taller than everybody, right? You know, and just... <laughs> 
started shouting, you know, all caps, like, listen to me, calm down. <laughs> and I don't remember what the debate was. I don't know if it was, oh God, it was, it was something about growth. Um, I, I, I think it was maybe, I, I think it was basically when we went from having monthly subscriptions to being free access plus paying for uh, land, right? Like, okay. like you know, hardly, well, there are lots of people who have been here with us the whole way. So <laughs> wonderfully enough, there are some people in the audience right now who actually remember that. But, you know, the, the, believe it or not, at, in the very beginning of Second Life, it was 15 bucks a month to to use it. And everybody was up in arms at the outrage of going to free. <laughs> and I stood up on a box and I said what, what Oberwolf just said, but not so eloquently. I basically said, look, we all love this, right? I, I, I remember I told the story. I said, has anybody heard of the well? The, you know, people here in the audience would know the well, but, you know, the well is was the whole earth electronic uh uh, what, what the heck was the other well, the uh, other L? But um, people in the audience knew about it. This is a, you know, Bay Area thing. You know, it was this amazing, amazing group of people that the Long Now Foundation, et cetera, came out of. And I, and I said, I, I said, does anybody remember the well? And people, said, yeah, I remember the well. And I said, it was 5,000 of the most amazing people talking to each other online, you know? And I said, you know what the well is today? <laughs> you know, it's like 4,000 of those same people, only 20 years older, talking to each other online. You know, they became that that community didn't survive, even though it was wonderful. And so I was saying to everybody, like, if we don't evolve, if we don't find a way to get more people in here, this cozy little campfire experience is just not going to be remembered, you know? And so it was, I was trying to say exactly the same thing. So I think I could imagine Second Life being wonderfully largely the same in terms of how it feels in 10 years. And on top of that, it is imperative that we do what we need to do to continue to make it as appealing to the new people downloading it right now as it was to those of us that downloaded it 20 years ago. So, yeah. you know, that's my answer. Great answer. How about you, Oberwolf? Where do you see Second Life 10 years from now? Um, so it's more, so what, what I see is I can't predict what the technology is going to be where we interact with, um, Things that are coming out of the cloud, right? So yeah. Second Life is is the thing. And, I, and I, I hope that we continue to, I hope that Second Life continues to evolve with the technology so that we can stay connected. Um, and I think we can. And so that's, that's really my goal. And that's, that's, or that's how I see it. So if we move to where we actually don't use computers and nobody has a monitor because you're wallpaper can turn into a computer or everybody's wearing um, augmented reality glasses. What, whatever the technology is, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can maintain Second Life and the beauty of it, which is the community aspect, that it doesn't become an individual experience that is, while wonderful um, and exploratory, um, it's, it separates us. And, and I see, and so a lot of the technology, you know, what's so interesting is the concept of social media, right? Yeah. So much of technology, social media, it's driving people into total isolation, right? Why we call it social media is absolutely hysterical to me. It should be called isolation media. It just drives <laughs> you into doing nothing but, um, staring at your own phone. So, so, um, so I hope that we can start I hope that we can evolve with the technology while maintaining. And I, so I hope they're consistent. We have to constantly be thinking about how do we evolve, maintain this core thing, which is, you know, if, if you don't, if you, if you don't need bread, you, if, if you don't steal, right? How can we maintain this goodness? People are generally good. You take everything away. They're good. They want to work each other like philip said the technology is going to be both helpful and hurtful to that so that's 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 my hope for 10 years from now i like that um we're, we are way over an hour um and there have been some questions that were submitted live uh, in our audience i'm going to take just a couple of minutes right. to maybe uh ask one or two more and then we're, we're going to have to cut it soon i know you guys also have to go uh so one of the questions that came in a question for philip the modern virtual world such as decentraland the sandbox etc use vr with oculus quest and the blockchain for virtual assets are these technologies in the 
plans of Linden Lab. So we already talked about VR. What about blockchain? Um, I think the simple answer is no. Um, right. But let me elaborate on that. So the VR we already talked about. So no. I mean, I mean, there's just not an obvious way to build VR for a big audience and, and a big inclusive audience yet, like we talked touched on earlier. Mm -hmm. With respect to blockchain, though, there's this weird thing that happens around tech where everybody kind of rails the needle all the way to the left or all the way to the right. And I think centralized, decentralized is actually one of those examples, right? Like, yeah. no one wants to live, let me just say, you know, wake up folks and realize nobody wants to live in a completely centralized world, obviously, right? You know, that's like Disneyland and Uncle Disney you know, reviews everything you're about to say and, you know, kicks you out if you make the slightest mistake or whatever. It, you know, that's and it, it, a completely centralized world would be extraordinarily homogenous. <laughs> As Oberwolf can attest to, it would also be extraordinarily expensive to moderate, right? You know, it just, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of dumb stuff to a completely centralized world. Things like Decentraland, though, are exploring the other limit, which is completely decentralized. And the thing that kind of makes me laugh as a technologist is that people don't recognize that obviously railing the needle all the way over to decentralized is also not workable um, for different reasons, for very different reasons, right? So I let me pick a great example that just everybody here must know this and laugh along, laugh along with me when I say this, right? You know, at some point, somebody breathlessly ran up to me and said something like, you know, Oh my God, Decentraland, land well, I'm going to have this plot of land in a city and I can own the plot of land and I can do absolutely anything I want on that plot of land and no one can stop me and no one can take it away from me. It's a free market, you know, God bless entrepreneurship and the blockchain and, you know, hallelujah. And of course, I'm just laughing, right? Because I'm thinking about, for those who remember in Second Life, you know, uh, you know, monopolistic control over a plot of land, which nobody can stop you from doing things on it unless they're willing to pay you enough is a kind of ex a horrific extortion mode that for those who remember the earliest days of second life you know we had people putting up you know you know putting up you know porn or whatever on boxes you know at the edges of their property just to uh you know piss off the people that they would then you know sell the land to that's an example of a failure mode of decentralization right is that the if you give the individual too much power and you don't allow the community to regulate things you're just completely screwed so i think that um it's important to realize that a healthy world like this one exists somewhere in between decentralized and centralized so that's the that that's basically the answer so so that that's the reason why i think it does blockchain have utility for some stuff yeah 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 it's fascinating i mean the idea of a large public ledger is intriguing but I don't see an obvious way that it would make something like Second Life, for example, um, immediately better. I agree, for sure. Okay, another one, uh, another question that just came in from the audience for Brad, sorry, for Oberwolf, <laughs> as an investor, what do you value the most about Second Life? Wow. Um, so, so I'm going to take that question because... Now, I'm going to put my investor hat on, but okay. that's one of five hats that I wear. Okay. So, so I'm going to be real, I'm going to try to answer the question very specifically, but it's hard because I actually wear my investor hat on very little uh, when it comes to Second Life. It's not, it's not my primary hat. So the investor side of me values the consistency of the experience and the loyalty of the communities and the residents. So that's a very, very valuable thing as an investor. Um, I don't look at Second Life and um, uh, I, I, we've, we've spent money, we've, we've cut money, we've hired people, we, we've had to not hire people, um, but we don't really, we, we think about the business side. So um, it's, a good, it's a good business. It's very consistent. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most valuable thing, the concurrency and such. Um, it's also a double-edged sword as an investor. That's very concerning. Um, if you see any, any cracks in that, in that wonderfulness, um, then, then you get very concerned and, and you have to react. Um, I joke that 
positive news is a data point, negative news is a trend, and you've got to stay on top of all these things. And, and you know, that's sometimes boring and not that fun. And the, the team doesn't want to want to talk about that stuff. But um, let me let me change my answer because it's changing as I'm going. Okay. As an investor, I have a new answer. Um, <laughs> Starby, you've been in meetings with me. This isn't the first. So <laughs> that previous answer was wrong. Okay. I have a good. I have I have the more re- real answer. As an investor, it's amazing because as an investor, all the things that I want as an investor are also fun to work on, great to work with the Lindens, and good for the residents and the community. And so to have it so that as an investor. I can invest more and get more out rather than have to cut things or make drastic changes. The, my favorite thing as an investor is that everything I want as an investor can be accomplished while wearing, while wearing my non-investor hat. My, I'm, I walk in the shoes of the resident hat. I'm a Linden hat. I'm mm. um, a, a marketing professional hat. I can, I can accomplish all of my investor goals without wearing my investor hat. I just have to say, very second life moment, every time Overwolf says as an investor, I'm flashing to this, like, I'm, I'm flashing to him, and, and of course I, I know him as a real person, like with a big cigar like Burt Bert Reynolds in like, a, <laughs> in like an old uh, antique clawfoot tub covered with $100 bills, right? Oh like he's you know, bathing in money in the, <laughs> as an investor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great picture. Up. I love it. Right. But okay. the truth is, I don't own a car or my it's house. True. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Okay. Uh, it's this funny. is hilarious. Okay, so one more, <laughs> one more question quickly that came in from the audience, and then I'll um, end the show with my last question. So for Philip, what aspect of Second Life do you hope never changes? I don't know. That seems like a softball. A lot of it. <laughs> I don't know. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots. The people, the people get along. I guess the only subtle thing we could do is we could screw up by making it just like Overwolf was saying, we could, we could make it into social media where you hang out with the people you already know in real life, but you just like them less and talk less. Right. Like that's just horrible. And, and I think that we could, I mean, I think it's very unlikely, but you know, something like second life could become something more like, you know, I don't know, you know, playing, playing video games with your four friends runs from from high school or something and I, I certainly wouldn't want to see that happen I, I think what's wonderful is how it brings it brings people that you know didn't know each other together yeah i hope a lot doesn't change i, I like it a lot as and, it is and my, but... my my pants will never change either <laughs> yeah that's another point people keep asking will philip change his avatar and i hope you really never do no <laughs> no that's great to no. hear excellent uh, that's god you're still right that's what it should have said what's not going to change in 10 years me my <laughs> I love that. Okay, so my last question that I've been asking everybody, because I'm trying to start a war, is Second Life a game? So, Oberwolf, why don't you go first? Is Second Life a game? It is not a game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that doesn't mean it's not fun. Yeah. It doesn't mean that there's not games that go on in it. Second Life is not a game, and so I've, you've tried to start this war with me before, but <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I've learned that sidestepping doesn't work, um, that the only answer is it's not a game. Okay, how about you, Philip? Is Second uh, Life a game? I was trying to do like, you know, some famous London like Torley would have, would have been sitting in the background. Oh, and would have, Torley. While, while Overwolf was talking, <laughs> Torley would have downloaded the Dwight uh, yes. Second Life is not a game. Yes. And, you know, that, that, that's what I, what I want right now is for you all to hear Dwight shoot saying <laughs> Second Life is not a game. That's, that's basically my, my answer. I, yeah, I think that it's a, I, I don't, the game thing is, we used to have this discussion in the office about how nature doesn't have hierarchy. We, uh, Corey, our amazing, um, you know, brilliant uh, uh, former CTO and I used to just get in these hilarious, you know, philosophical gunfights about different things. And one of them was about nature doesn't have hierarchy. And then another one, you know, and the whole it's not a game thing is kind of it, you know, it, it, it fades into vapor if you talk about it enough. I don't, I don't, I don't really know that I know what that means anymore. I don't know what it means when I said it. I do, I do think, I guess I, the, the piece of that war I would take on is, I have heard people say that if Second Life had been 
presented at the outset as like being a game like if we hadn't called it second life but we called it you know whatever you know something something different that was game like that it would have allowed us to get bigger um i don't think that's true so i think that's kind of a you know i can actually take a position on that i, I don't think that saying it was a game or something would have somehow made there be hundreds of millions of people in here and yeah. I don't think that's true. So I, I guess what I would say is it doesn't really matter. In the end, I don't think it really mattered. Um, yep. that, that's that, my that answer. Like doesn't really matter. <laughs> that's how I feel. I'm so glad you mentioned Torley because Torley was amazing. And, and I'm glad we're giving a shout out to Torley. So we are at the end of the show. And I want to give you both a chance to, you know, you, do you have any last words for the audience, Oberwolf? Do you want to say anything? To the audience. Well, thank you for allowing me to go first, because if I had to fill up, follow <laughs> Philip on this one, I, I, know. I, would, I would I would pretend my microphone was broken. <laughs> um, so I so um I Philip, please be very philosophical and and wonderful. I'm going to be a little bit more tactical um, yeah. on this one. So one of the things, um, one of the things that we can do as Lindens is make Second Life better. And I will tell you, having been in hundreds of meetings, not a single meeting has ever started, been discussed, or ended. How can we make this worse for the residents? How can we make this worse <laughs> for the world? Not one meeting has ever started that way. We've never discussed it, and we've never ended that way. And yet, every time we do something that we think is good in some way, shape, or form, there's an uprising. And it actually creates a lot of fear on the side of the Lindens. It makes it so that we don't try lots of things that could potentially be beneficial because yeah. we're afraid of like massive negative reaction. Now, so, so I would never say something like that without asking. What I'm asking, what I wanna end with is the community to A, come up with ideas that, that you think are good for the world and for, for making this stick around for 10 years. But, to, but when we make changes or we try something new, seek first to understand before trying to be understood or telling us that we've now ruined <laughs> Second Life forever. Right. Um, because you're gonna benefit greatly if you let us mess around with things and try things and launch things that break. Sure. This is a wonderful thing here. And if we have to treat it as something where every two steps forward, we have to be so afraid of what the response is going to be. Like, we're going to break stuff. This stuff has been around for 20 years. That doesn't mean it's bad. It works. It's been around for 20 years. Um, Mojo <laughs> told me that the first week he was here. Um, <laughs> but, but it does mean that every time we try to do something, something breaks. Right. Every time. And I guarantee that if we're a little bit more open to things breaking and letting us fix them, rather than we are so afraid of breaking anything, you will get more stuff. Guaranteed. You will get a better world out of it. Um, and so that's that's sort of, I'll end on that request and a thank you. A thank you, one to you, uh, Strawberry, um, to Tussle, to all the Lindens, and to everyone that spent their hour plus um, with us, I think that um, I think that it was really special. And like Philip, um, it is such a it's such an amazing thing to be up on this stage. And 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 it's not you know hashtag gratitude. I, I really <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone. Wonderful, thank you, Oberwolf. Uh, how about you, Philip? Any last words? I just want to know where to get a motorcycle with a <laughs> back seat for Oberwolf, so that he can ride with me. I so, want to see you guys so riding together. That'll be great. I want somebody to, you know, <laughs> send me a motorcycle so I can get him hanging out with me in world. <laughs> now I know how to do it. The plan is clear. <laughs> um, no, I, it's totally wonderful to be here. And I, and I think Overwolf's point about uh, supporting us and trying to grow and change Second Life in the right ways, it, it, it is a really good point. He, he made such a good point there that that... We've historically just been, like Oberwolf said, we've been almost afraid of, you know, the, the intimate relationship between the world uh, of Second Life and the people that live there and us 
as a company is just so fascinating, but it does restrict us a lot of the time from making um, changes at all. And so I, I do think that he has a great point that, you know, if you try to find ways to like support us as, or, you know, support us in equal measure, like, you know, tell us, Hey, you know, we encourage you to do this, you know, in, in as much with as much airtime as you tell us you're ruining everything. Right. Um, it might, that might be helpful. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's a really great point, but, but definitely send me a uh, motorcycle suggestion and uh, <laughs> you'll, you should, you'll find me and Oprah Wolf out there riding up in the sunset. I can just see you getting a truckload of motorcycles from the marketplace being sent to you right now. <laughs> uh, I know they're already, yeah, they're coming in already. Right? Being awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much, both of you. I really appreciate it. I know you're both so busy, and I know I really appreciate it, and the audience and the residents, they all appreciate you guys taking your time and, and spending this hour and a half with us. Your Linden Bears are right here in the front, so I think they're going to be here for a while. Hopefully, Patch will leave it at least for a few hours. So you guys can drop by the SL20B Arboretum and pick up their Linden Bears if you want to. They're official. I love that Phillips is wearing the same outfit. That's awesome. Um, so come by. And, and pick up the Linden Bears and thank you so much for uh, everybody uh, for, the, for, all the, for all the wonderful questions all the meaningful philosophical wonderful questions you guys had and we have more Lab Gabs coming later this week so tune in again and as Ebe used to say stay safe and stay virtual bye everyone thank you thank you thanks everybody